Yu is the Emanuel Heller. Prof John Yu is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he's a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. Uh, he earned his undergraduate degree from Harvard and his law degree from Yale Law School. Um, one of the nation's leading experts uh, on executive power uh, in constitutional law, especially from an originalist perspective, uh, he's served in all three branches of government, uh, uh, most famously as an official in the Department of Justice, uh, where he worked on national security and terrorism after 9-11. Um, a number of books on executive power, uh, including Crisis in Command, which is sort of a history of executive power in times of crisis, um, and most recently, Defender in Chief, Trump's Fight for Presidential Power, which was published last year. I should also mention he clerked for Justice Thomas. Uh, I know Professor Yu because we teach together uh, every summer in a program for law students. Um, so I, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, discussing these matters and others. Uh, we had a recent dispute um, in the pages of National Review on uh, the Constitution and the First Amendment, but our subject today is uh, executive power and the Constitution. So, Professor Yu, the class is yours. Thank you, uh, Phil. Thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry I'm not there, but also I, I have to correct Phil's biography. She le he left out the most important part of my background, which is that I first met Amy Coney Barrett when she was a 24-year-old law student at Notre Dame. That is my claim to fame. And I'm just waiting for the Notre Dame Law School to rename itself the Amy Coney Barrett School of Law. I mean, what is taking so long with the people there? Or at least name that fancy skybox at the football stadium after her. Uh, I really wish I was there. I, I'm amazed so many of you have shown up. There's more of you there now than would actually attend a University of California Berkeley football game. Well, it's usually because they're all off inventing something, I suppose. So it's really great to be with you. I really uh, wish I could be there in person and hopefully uh, I will be able to after these lockdowns are over. And as uh, Phil said, uh, let's, I'm just gonna make a few introductory remarks about the presidency and my involvement in it. Uh, I was looking at your readings for today uh, and I was an official at the Department of Justice on 9-11. And so I was looking at it and I was like, oh yeah, I remember doing that. Oh yeah, I remember doing that one too. And I was like, hey, how the hell did they find out about that thing we did? So I'd be very happy to take questions. I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, what informed us while we were making a lot of these controversial decisions, maybe some of the most controversial decisions about uh, presidential power in our lifetimes. Um, also, uh, afterwards, uh, after sort of these brief introductory remarks, I hope uh, we can engage in a give and take and uh, hear questions and comments. I, I will warn you that if nobody has questions, which often happens to us in law school, just like in undergrad, but in law school, we have a trick, which is then I start to randomly call on people. So it's much better if you guys ask me questions. Because if I start asking you random questions, I'm gonna start asking you things that you're not gonna be prepared for. And if you don't know the answers, then in law school, we have every right to make fun of you as much as I want until somebody answers the question. So much better if you guys come with lots of questions and engage uh, with the issues we have before us. Okay, so if I hear no objections to those uh, ground rules, no? Okay, let me start. So, uh, I uh, have been studying the presidency uh, really ever since I graduated, actually ever since I was in law school. And then I graduated from law school and at a you know, youngish age in my early 30s, I went to, to Washington uh, to serve in the Bush Justice Department. Uh, and I was there starting the summer before the 9-11 attacks. And it was a quiet administration. Uh, people don't remember this now, but the Bush administration was elected to return our foreign policy to normalcy. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, who later became Secretary of State, famously said, you know, the 82nd Airborne is not gonna be escorting kids to school anymore, which is what they had been doing in the Balkans. It was an uh, administration that was focused on tax cuts and school choice. And um, we had a big fight about um, what to do with fetal tissue, for example, that summer. 
personally, I was one of the few people who were hired to sort of be on duty for foreign affairs questions, but no one thought foreign affairs were gonna be a big issue in the Bush administration. I can tell you the day before 9-11, I was working on a treaty about polar bears whether we should engage with other countries to protect polar bears. That's the kind of foreign affairs questions we were uh, dealing with at the time on September 10th, 2001. So, so one lesson about the presidency, just to start with is, you don't know what's gonna happen. You can prepare for everything, but uh, life, world affairs, domestic affairs have a way of throwing things at you. And of course, we're living through a crisis just like that now with the pandemic and COVID-19, the lockdowns. Uh, the crisis for us was the terrible attack on 9-11 when Al-Qaeda launched a coordinated series of attacks from within our own territory and used jetliners, essentially hijacked them and converted them into guided missiles and destroyed the World Trade Center in New York, hit the Pentagon, almost completely destroyed the Pentagon. Just as a side note, for those of you who don't know, uh, it, obviously, the Pentagon has five sides. And at the time, the Pentagon was undergoing renovation uh, to actually withstand a bomb blast. Only one of the five sides had been renovated by 9-11. And as chance would have it, the hijacked airplane hit that one reinforced side. If it had hit any of the other four sides of the Pentagon, the Pentagon itself would have been completely destroyed, yeah, completely destroyed. So in a way, we were our military was command was uh, in a way lucky that day, although it was a terrible day. And so I was at the department in charge uh, of the office, the Office of Legal Counsel, whose job it is, is to advise the president on his or her constitutional authority on a day when we were attacked. Uh, the first time the uh, American territory had been attacked since December 7th, 1941 in Pearl Harbor the first time our capital had been attacked since the war of 1812 by a foreign enemy. And by an enemy that was different than any we'd ever had before. Not a nation state, not an empire, but a group, a group that had no territory or population, no cities. It was a non-governmental organization. Other countries had fought terrorists, Italy, Great Britain, Israel, of course, but the United States, we had never really fought a terrorist group before. So we had no um, off the shelf book or manual to tell us what to do. So how do we approach this? Everything you have read in your reading are things that we looked at and thought about and read at the time. The very first question the president asked on 9-11 is, is this a war? Are we at war? Who gets to decide whether it's war? Before 9-11, everybody, Democrats, Republicans, presidents, Congresses, had thought of terrorism as a criminal law problem. Nothing really that different than handling mafia dons, handling drug cartels. It was a problem where we would send out the FBI which we did in the year before on 2000, when Al Qaeda tried to destroy a, a U.S. destroyer in Yemen, it was we would send out prosecutors. We would arrest the terrorists, bring them back to the United States, and try them in our courts of law and give them all the protections of the Bill of Rights. So on September 11th, that's the very first question that we were asked: Is this different? Is this still a criminal justice problem, or is this a matter for war? And who gets to decide that question? And so I looked at the same readings you looked at for this class and the classes you've had just before. Because there's no cases. The Supreme Court has never said, ah, war means something that has A, B, and C characteristics. Or you can have war with terrorists or not. The Supreme Court has never faced that question. Congress had never passed a law facing that question. Presidents in the past had never issued any executive orders. And so I looked at the same things you did. And first of all, I have to admit, I am a Hamiltonian. I think that he's got it about right in the Pacificus papers and Helvidius and Pacificus. And 
basically we used his theory. And as you know from your readings, what is his theory? Uh, does anyone wanna volunteer now what the pacificist theory of the presidency uh, would be with regard to whether something is a war or not, or something is a foreign policy problem or not? Would, would President Bush have had to say, I'm gonna wait until Congress decides, or do you think the president could decide? And if so, why? And I'll, I'll tell you, of course, the answer is that President Bush did decide it was a war that night. But why does who who's this sort of start off? Why would Pacificus, Hamilton, Hamilton's view? Okay, uh, and we have we have microphones out here, so we can run these around. Soren, maybe you can help me run these around. Go ahead, Kelly. Thanks. Introduce yourself, too. Oh, I'm Kelly. I'm a senior in American Studies. Great. And Pacificus uh, would have, or Hamilton argued By the way, that. did your parents name you Kelly just to make sure you would get into Notre Dame? Probably. I was, <laughs> I, I realized that Kelly means Celtic warrior. So I say my name literally <laughs> means fighting Irish. Oh, I, I was born with, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> I didn't fun, know that. fun fact, fun fact. Um, so Pacificus would have argued that the most important attribute to the presidency for its success is for it to be energetic and that. Mm that energy needs to come from unity. And the more people that are involved in these war decisions um, deplete that unity. And so he would have said that Bush by his authority that was endowed to him by the people through the election of his presidency would be sufficient to make that war command. Okay, Kelly, so, uh, so we could call this a, what we would call a functional explanation. Why? is the presidency the best institution to decide about war. So what your explanation I think is actually even more fully expressed by Hamilton in the Federalist Papers and then it appears again in Pacificus. But you're right, one is this functional explanation. The presidency, unlike the other two branches, uh, concentrates all of the power of the branch into one person. That can be bad. What if the one person is an idiot? What if the one person makes lots of mistakes? But the upside is one person, as Kelly said, can act quickly and decisively. Uh, the phrase Hamilton uses is with speed dispatch. Right? Uh, energy in the executive, Hamilton said, is the leading characteristic of good government. Um, and so the idea is you have this crisis, a 9-11 attack. The president can act faster. It's not that the president is a better person than Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell or Right, John Ro Chief Justice John Roberts. It's just that the presidency, because it's designed a certain way, can act quickly. Right. Good. Anybody else? What else would Hamilton say? Why can't you know? Or does someone want to describe what Madison's retort to Kelly would be? Madison would say, "Oh, Kelly, nice try, but you don't really get it." What would Helvidia say? Back to Kelly. Do we have any pro Madisonians in the audience? I'm sorry, in the class. This is not an audience. Hang on a second. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. My name is Solomon. Um, Solomon Duane. Uh, so your parents definitely did not name you to try to get you into Notre Dame. <laughs> they did not. They did not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think um, Madison would have said that uh, war is legislative by nature and that Good. the legislative should set that policy and thereby allow the president to execute it. Good. Madison just says <clears throat> war is a legislative decision. And so Congress should set it. And then the president, once the decision is made, carries it out. Now, Solomon, why does Madison or why do you think, if you agree with Madison, why do you think war is a legislative decision? Kelly just said, on a war sudden and immediate, the president has to just respond on behalf of the country because he or she is a single person and can act quickly. Why do you think, in contrast, war is more legislative? I'm not sure I personally agree with that exactly, but I, I would mm -hmm. imagine a primary argument could be made that it, it's uh, since the time of the writing of the Constitution, the nature of war, and I imagine the founding fathers might have anticipated it, it's so so volatile. 
and uh, it can it can change. I mean, war today is so different than what it was then. Mm-hmm. And I think just it, maybe having that safety net of having the more deliberate action, uh, more deliberative action of Congress and the legislative branch would have allowed them to uh, ensure that, you know, down the line as we have more dangerous weapons that we weren't giving more power to the president than we would have, you know, in the 1800s, giving that power to him. I suppose. <clears throat> okay, so I think that's good. The first part of what you said, that war changes and volatile. Actually, you're feeding more into Kelly's argument there, right? Because Kelly would say, is as specific as, oh, the, the way that war changes and is different makes it harder for Congress to pass laws beforehand to take it all into account. Right? It's more likely when you're passing a law, you want to write something that you're really familiar with, that you know a lot about. If it's something that you have no idea is going to happen beforehand. How do you even know to be able to write a law? But what you said in the second two points, I think is more Madisonian. You know, one is, War is such an important decision for society. It costs so much. It is so dangerous. Do we want one person to be able to decide that for the country? Isn't it better? As you you use use the word deliberate. Don't we want to deliberate, think about it before we plunge the country into something that is so dangerous for the country? And history tells us often concentrates power into executives. And sometimes those executives become dictators. So then Madison's third point that your second point there is, and we should worry about the balance of powers between the executive and the legislative. We don't want things to get so out of hand that President Bush aggregates almost monarchical powers. right? And the Madison and Helvidius goes on and on about how the whole point to the American Revolution was to get rid of this monarchy, King George III. Why would we create a constitution that would replace him with a president? So he says, you know, we actually have a, as Solomon says, a constitution where war should be a legislative decision because most important decisions should be legislative decisions. Let the president be the person whose job it is just to carry out legislative decisions. Does anybody have... Uh, a rejoinder to Solomon. Solomon's brave, brave. Even though he wanted to make clear, he's not sure he agreed with Madison. He did a good job articulating Madison's view. Does anyone want to uh, reply to Solomon? Uh, what else would Ma- uh, What else would Hamilton say? By the way, while the mic's going over, you should realize Hamilton and Madison during the right writing of the Constitution were great collaborators. As you know, they wrote the. Right. They wrote the Federal's papers together. By the time of the Helvetia Pacificus debates, they become enemies. So it is um, a lesson to take away from politics that you never know when your college roommate is going to turn on you. Okay. Hi, Professor. I'm Corinne Carlson. I'm a sophomore in the program of liberal studies. Um, I think that maybe Hamilton would propose that, like, even if Congress is deliberating to launch us into an offensive war, um, Mm. the president has the authority to recognize when a a new state of war exists and respond to an attack against us. Good. So Hamilton says that, right? Hamilton does say, and he says elsewhere, Uh, regardless of how you come down on this offensive war question, at the very least when the country's attacked, someone has to reply right away. What about Solomon's point, though, that, well, but war is so dear, so dangerous, that we still want to deliberate about it. Maybe Hamilton could say, okay, President Bush can take defensive measures after 9-11, uh, you know, this is something I, I was there for. I saw, uh, I saw combat air patrols fly over Washington, D.C. When I went home the night of 9-11, um, I, saw, I drove right by the Pentagon. I saw the Pentagon on fire. It's something I think, I hope we never see again. I saw deployed troops at every airport. All air traffic was stopped. Stock markets were shut down. Uh, the country closed its borders. Um, Trump can put, I'm sorry, Bush can put the country on this military footing. But then he bombed Afghanistan too, right? And then we invaded Afghanistan um, just a month or so, month and a half after. No, just about a month after. Does, 
does do you think that President Bush needed to have Congress authorize going into Afghanistan? What do you think Hamilton would say about that, Corinne? I think Hamilton would say that since we had already been launched into a state of war and mm. like we didn't necessarily initiate the war, but the president does have the right to respond to the state of war that's already been initiated. Mm. So the defensive measures on the home front are one thing, but like since we've already been put in war, he has the authority to go into Afghanistan as well. Good. So this is where you could say this is where Helvidius and Pacificus really come into conflict is what if the president, okay, he does the defensive measures Corinne talks about, but then he says, but to finish them off, to stop future attacks, I got to go to Afghanistan and wage an offensive war to finish the job. And suppose people in Congress say, no, 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 we don't want to start a war in Afghanistan. You know, look at all the empires that have tried to win Afghanistan. No one has really successfully conquered Afghanistan, right? Afghanistan is famously called the graveyard of empires. We don't want to go there. We're not going to cooperate with you. Where does the president get the power that Corinne's talking about to not just right, secure the defense, but to then continue the war to the enemy's side abroad to try to stop the threat in the future? So far, um, Kelly and Corinne have not mentioned any particular clause in the Constitution. Whereas I think Solomon could say, well, there's the declare war clause. So doesn't that mean the Congress ought to declare war? And in this case, that's deciding whether a war exists. So where would, uh, and then this is, I gotta tell you, this is exactly the way you guys are replicating exactly how we were thinking about it back uh, on uh, the day of 9-11, while we were still worried about getting hit by even more attacks. So who, uh, who wants to volunteer to point out any constitutional provisions uh, on either side of the Pacificus Helvidius debate? Notice, uh, and but I, I don't blame you, most of the discussion in the Helvidius and Pacificus papers is not really tethered to specific constitutional provisions. They make the same arguments you do. Is the presidency well designed or better designed? Is the legislature better because it's deliberative? But they do have to tie it down at some point to constitutional text. Who wants to volunteer which ones are you know, best for the Solomon side or best for the Kelly Corinne side? Hi, Professor Yu. I'm Aliks. I'm a junior studying economics. Um, I would say the most clear ones are obviously the commander in chief of the armed forces for the side of the president. And also the president as sort of the de facto figurehead in foreign relations with the treaty power. Um, but then on the Congress side, of course, Congress has power to declare war, but additionally, Congress has power of the purse and control over financial parts of the economy and the. Um, oh, well, you're an economist. Of course, everything is about the power of the purse. It's all about the money. <laughs> That's who's going to pay. Right. Uh, good. So you can say on the one hand, you have the president as the commander in chief. He's also you said, you know, the sort of the head of government. Um, I would uh, just amend what you said. It's not just the treaty power. Hamilton looks at the executive power. Right? The, the first sentence of Article II of the Constitution says the executive power of the United States is vested in the president. And then the treaty power is part of that. And you're right. On the congressional side, you have declare war. And as you said, the power of the press, who, pay, who raises the army? Who creates the army? Who pays for its, uh, its weapons? Who pays to pay the soldiers? which one of those is dominant. So uh, just to return back to the story of 9-11, we quickly decided uh, that uh, just along with Hamilton, uh, the president is the commander in chief and the chief executive of the country. And he has to, or she has to decide on the spot during an emergency circumstance, whether to reply and how uh, using the military, and this goes to your point about the economy, the, using the military that Congress has already paid for. Uh, but we also advise the president, if you wanna keep fighting, if you wanna go to Afghanistan, we may think constitutionally you could do that. We did follow Corinne 
Kelly's point of view that you could continue fighting, take the war to the enemy to stop the threat. But you should go to Congress because they're going to have to pay for it. You know, they create a certain military, but it's going to run out. Modern war is very expensive. Um, Solomon talked about new weapons. We're going to have to ask Congress to develop new weapon systems, new capabilities. War of this kind is going to be different than fighting World War II or Vietnam. And so we need to go to Congress to get their cooperation politically. So constitutionally, we said, even if Congress tried to stop us, we do think that the president ultimately has that constitutional authority to go to war to stop an enemy that's threatening us. John, can I, John, can I inter intrude? In, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Here, Somebody had a, a comment. In here? Sure. So is there, um, in your thinking, uh, after 9-11, uh, is Afghanistan a continuation of the same war? So once you're in war, you're in war? Yeah. Or is there a transition from a defensive action, which the president would have under basically anyone to repel sudden attacks, um, but there's no transition from a defensive war to an offensive war? Once you're in war, you're just in war? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Phil. Um, I have to say that because Phil's your professor. But, uh, could, uh, but, but actually, it is a really good question, Phil, is when, and, and this is something Madison addresses, and Madison in the Helvidius papers is worried about war becoming kind of permanent. Remember, he says something like, you know, presidents get grand. the presidents love war, Madison says, because it aggrandizes them. It gives them the chance for glory. They don't mind if a state of war goes on. And so that's another reason uh, Solomon's point about, well, let's have Congress decide because they're going to be watching the president like a hawk. And so you could worry about a war that, as Phil's talking about, that starts out defensively and just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, I have to tell you, on September 11th, we weren't thinking about that. We did start to think about it a little later in the war. But at the beginning, we thought of, as Phil mentioned, uh, I th think described it fairly, we thought once we were attacked, if the enemy is located in Afghanistan, or the enemies located in Saudi Arabia or Indonesia you know, being this kind of dispersed network. Part of fighting that war is to stop their ability to attack us again. And so it is to, uh, to us, it was a continuation. Iraq was different. So Iraq, the Iraq wars in 2002, um, I mean, the, sorry, the authorization to use forces 2002, the war itself starts in 2003. There were some people in the U.S. government at the time who tried to argue that the Iraq war itself, Iraq itself was linked to the 9-11 attacks. Uh, at the time, I didn't see any evidence to that effect. And so I said the Iraq war is a different war. That is a purely, much more purely offensive war. They, Iraq was firing at our troops and our, uh, air, uh, air, our fighter jets and so on in the region. They were causing all kinds of trouble. But they were not part of 9-11. So that's a good point, Phil. There's a, there is, I think, still this difference. Uh, I think you could still say, even though it's getting far, it's 20 years away almost now, and it's spread out around the world at a much lower level of intensity than before. But to me, even now, it's still part of that defensive war that started on 9-11. But I quite admit, this does go to uh, the Madisonian worry that, uh, well, does war going on so long, will it lead to some kind of pre permanent uh, expansion of presidential power, which Madison says is bad, is bad for liberty, right? It's bad for individual freedom. John, let me ask one other question. I've been meaning to ask you this for years. I never, I always forget. Uh, I went back and I watched um, on September 12th, uh, President Bush is uh, with the, in the White House with congressional leaders, I wonder mm -hmm. if you're in the room and the media is covering it, it's live. Uh, and he describes the acts of the day before as acts of war. Mm -hmm. And was that deliberate that um, to recognize for constitutional reasons? Uh, when I heard those words, I was, what I heard was the president was saying, we are at war when he called them acts of war. Uh, were you part of drafting that language or did you have a hand yeah. in that language? That's, uh, that's, that's, that's exactly right, Phil. That, that language was uh, important and was what we worked on was that day in 9-11, we had to make that fundamental decision. Is the president going to say this is war? Because until 9-11, up to September 10th, it was crime. And crime has all the 
processes and procedures that you see on TV in any cop show. You know, Law and Order essentially does a pretty good job teaching all the steps of uh, the criminal justice system. And so to say this is war to us meant it's in a different constitutional category. Um, there's a whole different set of rules and powers that apply in war that don't exist. And we don't want them to exist in peacetime. We had tried to handle terrorism before 9-11 in the, with those peacetime powers and procedures, on 9-11, we decided that didn't work. So the other thing you, you'll know, as Phil says, that in that uh, first big public announcement the next day, uh, President Bush is with the leaders of Congress. And so the other thing we did is uh, we asked Congress uh, to pass a law also recognizing a state of war. Uh, so even though, uh, you know, Solomon's point is, well, does Congress need to declare war first? Even though we took the view constitutionally, more like Corinne's view that you didn't need, or Kelly's view, you didn't need to have a declaration of war because we were already attacked. We thought it was a good idea politically to have Congress join us and issue something like a declaration. Although they didn't call it declaration of war, right? They call these things authorizations to use military force. As in so many ways, the 21st century, it takes 10 times as many words to do something that the 18th century did in one or two words. So they called it authorization to use military force, but it essentially was a declaration of war. And I, I helped draft it. I mean, I negotiated on behalf of the executive branch with the lawyers from Congress. Uh, and, and I actually, before this, I was a lawyer for Congress. I also was a lawyer at the Senate Judiciary Committee. So I saw, I could see both sides of uh, the debate. Um, and then, but this is interesting also, um, the courts eventually had to decide, you, you've read some of the, you've had a sign and I hope read of some of the detainee right cases. Uh, and they start coming up to the Supreme Court about two years later, right? The very first one, Hamdi comes in around 2003, I believe at the Supreme Court. And then you start to get other ones, 2004, five and six cases like Boumedian and so on. Hamdi. So uh, at that point, the court has the opportunity, right, to also weigh in on this question. Is it a war? If the court had, uh, the lawyers for Hamdi, Boumedian, they said, this is not a war. They said, constitutionally, the United States cannot wage war against a group. It has to wage war against a nation. And so all these things you've done, like holding people without criminal trial, is unconstitutional because if this is still the peacetime criminal justice system, then you know these our clients haven't been given the right to a lawyer and appear in a federal court before a jury. What are they charged with? Uh, and notice the Supreme Court in those detainee cases also agrees that it is war. So that's that's, that's the interesting thing, uh, and it goes to this fundamental issue everybody's been talking about is. What happens when you have a new war, a new crisis with facts you haven't seen before the outside our past experience? In this case, each of the three branches eventually decide the president right away because right, he's one person. He acts immediately. She acts immediately on behalf of the country. Congress, about a, uh, one week later, they pass their authorization to use force on September 18th. Notice it's still in effect uh, now. Uh, they deliberate about a week about it. And then they also pass something called the Patriot Act, which we can talk about about a month later. And then the Supreme Court, which hears cases, they make their choice known two years later and then three years later. But in this case, all three branches get their say. In this case, they all agreed. Uh, you know, what happens when they disagree is a difficult question that we've faced very few times in our history. Any other questions about that sort of fundamental decision? Oh, so to tell you what we did, obviously uh, we decided it was war. President Bush made that decision. And as Phil said, he announced that the next day. Then we had a series of questions, which we'll talk about. Every issue that you've got on your reading list I'm looking at here comes up then once you make this decision. We're gonna change paths from criminal justice where we know right exactly what happens. You get arrested, you get your Miranda warnings. The police take you to a jail cell, then you're presented to a judge, and then you meet your, your lawyer, and then you have the right to remain silent, and then you get a trial, and you get a jury, and then you're released or not. What are the rules when you change paths and say, no, this is going to be war now? 
Every one of the issues that you're reading about here, detention, warrantless wiretapping, right? uh, drone, I don't see the opinion about drones, but drones, all of those are basically deal with this same question we're starting out now. You start with the decision, it's war or peacetime. Once you go down war, all those same things you do in the criminal justice system, you have to figure out how we're gonna do them now in wartime. And there, each one of those are controversial, of course, and difficult. But you, once you decide it's war, you have to face them. You have to set up a new framework for dealing with this enemy. It's also, we have a, we have a book for off the shelf for how to deal with all these questions if you're fighting a nation. If we went to war with China or Germany or Russia, well, we know how to solve all, we have rules for all of those. What made this unique was we had something we were fighting a war with that was not a country. And so we had to figure out what, how do we deal with each of these questions in that new setting? Any, any questions about that before I, I suppose the next thing we could do is just talk about each of these decisions and you guys can uh, ask about them or I could tell you how we thought about it. Or you can let, let we can we decide whether it's right or wrong. We have a couple questions, I think. Yeah, good. Hi, um, my name is Carson. I'm a junior political science and math major. Um, I had a question about the AUMF. Um, so Congresswoman Barbara Lee was the, the sole uh, congressperson to vote no. Um, Ironically, my congresswoman. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. Guess which city she represents? Berkeley, California. Okay, go ahead. Um, but so she recently said, I think in 2019, that the AUMF, mm -hmm. AUMF has been used 41 times in 18 different countries to authorize military force. So it seems that her worst fears when she voted no, Madison's worst fears are kind of being uh, confirmed in that this, this AUMF has been used, it seems well beyond what it was intended to be used for. So I guess, how do you respond to that? Is there a point where the AUMF will stop being used? Should it have stopped being used long ago? Um, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? So she's quite right that we are using it a lot in many countries and we're using it 20 years later. Uh, where I don't necessarily agree with her is that this was all unintended. Uh, and so look at the AUMF, it's, it's text. Um, it says that the president is authorized to use force against any group or person or nation that was involved with the 9-11 attacks or that supports or protects anyone afterwards that's involved with the 9-11 attacks. Or uh, so uh, one thing you'll notice when you look at the difference between the AUMF and previous declarations of war. Um, and so let me say, you know, as I was a young aide in the, in the government at this time, but I had read every declaration of war before. Uh, there's, it's not hard. There's only five, but people forget. Uh, and I had read the different authorizations. Now, there are a lot more authorizations. This AUMF on 9-11 passed on September 18th is very different than those. It's not limited to a place. Most of them are obviously limited to, we declare war against Germany, we declare war against Japan. This one does not actually mention a place. It doesn't have uh, what we call in, uh, what Congress will call sunset date. It doesn't say it terminates as of this date or it's limited to this kind of fighting. It's actually uh, uh, unusual and that it's, it has no definition of time or place. Uh, and so Congresswoman Lee is right to say, well, that opens the door to being able to use the armed forces dozens of times in lots of countries. But I would say Congress uh, knew that. Uh, we explained it to them and they knew it when they voted for it. This is, so this is, um, uh, a political perspective, it actually came more to the fore uh, with the Iraq war, because the Iraq war also we passed, we had an AUMF done in late 2002. And uh, Congress really didn't want to vote for it one way or the other. And so there's a political dynamic. You see you're a political math major. There's a political element that's going on above the constitutional law you're studying, which is, suppose you took the Hamiltonian view. I'm sorry, the Madisonian view, the Solomonic view, right? We'll take Solomon's view. Congress has to essentially pull the trigger before the president can go to war. The problem is that in this modern day, Congress doesn't really wanna vote on it because it's too unpredictable. 
too dangerous. Things could go badly as the Iraq war did and Congress won't want to take responsibility. And so it was interesting. I think September 18th was an unusual moment of unity in the country. As you mentioned, uh, only Barbara Lee voted against it. Um, but by the time of the Iraq war, which is you know, the Iraq resolution, which is one year later, already you have severe partisan differences about it. But my main point is just that the, the authorizations are things Congress is often gonna run away from because they're very happy to let the executive branch actually take responsibility for it. Uh, if things go well, they could say, oh, we supported you. We gave you money. We bought the drones. We sent, the, you know, we paid for the troops. Things go badly. They're going to say that president, he screwed up. It's all his fault. It's all her fault. That's, that's not a constitutional issue. That's just the politics, I would say, that's going on on top of the constitutional law. Uh, so it's a, it's a great point. So, uh, you know, the problem for uh, Congresswoman Lee is, um, and there were people who wanted to do this, which is, should we place a limitation in the AUMF? Should we limit it just to Afghanistan or the Middle East? Should we say it expires in a year? This goes back to the very beginnings, uh, you know, uh, Kelly's point about why, why do we have the president? What is he there for? What is she there for? Uh, it's to respond to unforeseen uh, events, emergencies, challenges, crises. And can Congress actually on September 18th figure out and write down all the things that are going to happen in the future and prepare for them uh, in a statute? Or does some branch of the government just have to be there to respond immediately? And so, uh, you know, you've been, um, you know, reading, I, I, I got to say, by the way, you're very lucky to have this class and have Phil to study political theory and constitutional law. Um, you know, when I was a student in college, there was no class like the one you're, you have. You're so lucky. I sort of uh, had to figure it out by taking pieces from courses here and there. That might explain why I have such a strange view of the Constitution. But I never had this kind of class. But if you, you know, you're reading about the mixture of political theory and constitutional law, this idea of the executive that Kelly and Corinne have put forward, that Hamilton put forward, goes all the way back to Blackstone, to John Locke. John Luck, and then to Machiavelli, and uh, of course, through Hobbes. And this is idea, some part of the government has to be always in existence to respond to something you can't foresee. And so that's the problem a Congresswoman Lee has is, could she have written a law that would have said, okay, what about if you see part of Al Qaeda driving through the deserts of Yemen with no troops nearby and all you can do is shoot them with a drone? Or what if another part of a grow, you know, a cell of Al Qaeda ends up in Indonesia? Are you going to list by statute every place it could go? Or what if it turns out that you forget to put a place, or you don't think of a place, and then they go there? So that's that's the uh, that's the dilemma Congress is faced with: is they can't really anticipate something in the beginning when it's so strange and different, like 9/11. Good other questions. questions? Okay, we have, we have several questions. Hi, Professor, I'm Tim, I'm a physics major. Um, I just physics. Wanted... physics, you're in the wrong classroom. Yeah, I probably am. <laughs> um, I just had a question about, um, you said with the AUMFs, um, like Congress basically laid, could have laid out more parameters for the fighting and did say, mm -hmm. I'll lay out some parameters. Do they have the authority to even do that? Because it just says that they have the power to, to declare war, not mm -hmm. um, dictate the manner in which the war is going to be fought. Yeah, so that, that, that's an excellent uh, point. And sometimes, so you're the physics guy, right? So one problem with the Madisonian theory, the Madisonian theory is kind of like uh, Newtonian physics. He kind of thinks, oh, there's going to be this perfect balance. All the spheres are going to circle each other in a perfect mathematical fortune, and they will maintain a balance. Hamilton's view is very different, right? Ham it goes to your point. Hamilton's view is about conflict, right? Which is probably no surprise, right? Hamilton had been chief of staff to Washington during the Revolutionary War. Hamilton was a colonel. He actually, in person, led an attack uh, outside uh, New York and outside Yorktown. I mean, he's a, he's a soldier and he's a person of action. 
So Hamilton thinks of the executive as conflict. And so Hamilton takes up these problems that are very difficult for Madison, which is what if you actually have conflict between the executive and the legislative branch? Suppose rather than the open-ended AUMF that Congress passed, what if Congress had done more like what you're worried about? Congress had passed laws limiting the executive, saying um, you can fight Afghanistan, but you can't go farther. You can't attack Iraq. You can't attack Iran. Uh, you can't use, or what if they place limits on the method? You can't use drones or you can't use warrantless surveillance. Um, so you know, luckily we didn't have to face that in the beginning. As the war went on after 9-11, we started to run into that more and more often, usually more because Congress just didn't say anything. And we had to figure out what do you do? So our view was, and this, I, I think we agree with you, Paul, our view was that um, Congress uh, had certain ways to limit the executive, but it wasn't uh, passing a law saying, you're not allowed to so take World War II, we, what if Congress had passed a law saying, you're not allowed to invade Europe until you defeat Japan first, which was the reverse. Actually, that's what many Americans wanted at the time because of Pearl Harbor, but FDR, I think wisely so, said, no, we're gonna we're, we need to win in Europe first. What if Congress actually passed a law telling the president how to fight the war? So our view was constitutionally, Congress couldn't do that because as you say, where does Congress have the power to tell the president how to wage war? That's a commander in chief issue. Even if you buy the, uh, you know, Solomon's view that Congress has to turn the switch on for war, it doesn't tell Congress how, Congress then doesn't use a declare war clause to tell you how to fight it. So, uh, but, and this, this is more of the, uh, the kind of topics you're talking about in this class, but that doesn't mean Congress is without constitutional influence over the war. Congress doesn't have to pay for drones. Congress doesn't have to buy aircraft carriers. Congress doesn't have to fund a war in Afghanistan. The president may want to fight it, but if he doesn't have the troops and she doesn't have uh, the money to pay for missiles, the war is not going to be fought. <clears throat> In fact, I would say before World War II, this was a perfect check on presidential power in wartime because we had no standing military. Our military until World War II was primarily a border defense small uh, garrisons protecting overseas colonies, essentially. We had no permanent standing military. We, we, we just are used to it because we've all been born and live in a time where we have a the largest military in the world and we've had it this way since 1945. Before that, if you look at those wars you've studied in the past, look at the Civil War, our worst war. There's virtually no army in existence at the time of the Civil War. The president wants to fight the Civil War. He wants to fight the War of 1848, the War of 1812, or even World War I. The president has to go to Congress and say, please build me a military so I can fight this war. So while you're right, Congress can't tell the president, do this, do that. But through, our economist friend was right in the beginning, through the power over the purse, Congress used to have a 100% complete check um, wartime. So to take your question a little bit further, and maybe this is also a response to Barbara Lee, is could you say that when Congress creates the kind of military we have now, the largest in the world, over a million serving, uh, can we say Congress has already built into this system the ability for presidents to act with the initiative that Kelly and Corinne were talking about. And they're not trying to stop the president. They're giving him the tools. They're giving her the tools to act unilaterally in the beginning. And, uh, and this is something that was shocking to me I, I, that I learned on 9-11, uh, sorry to say, is that our military is not built for homeland defense. Uh, so when um, the uh, planes were, you know, I was, so just a, another little story. So uh, you know, this plane strike at the World Trade Center happens um, just around 9 a.m. Um, and I'm at work. First time, first one hits, we think it's it could have been a pilot mistake. Second one hits, I'm sure it's war. Uh, we go and um, evacuate to the uh, what's called the command center in the Justice Department, which is a vault enclosed with, I think it's about three inch steel around the whole thing and the doors, including the doors. 
And that's where we decide. And so secure linked communications to other cabinet agencies and to the White House situation room. So it occurred to me, this very heavy steel room, where is it? Where would you put it if you were, so you're a physics major, where would you put the steel room in the building to make sure it was safest? Probably in the middle. <laughs> oh, in the middle. I would have thought basement maybe, but guess where our federal architects put it? At the top, where if anything struck the building, the weight of the steel room would collapse all the way down all five flights to the bottom, killing everyone trapped in the little box. Anyway, so I was thinking about that during that time is what genius put the steel, you know, steel room at the top of this 80 year old building. So anyway, so on that day, we're getting in these reports about potential attacks here, potential attacks there. We find out that there is this airliner hits the Pentagon and that there's another airliner that's not responding, that's headed to Washington, D.C. Of course, we're worried, as it turns out was the plan, that it's, that's aiming for the Capitol or for the White House. There are At this time, there are no armed fighter jets on station to protect Washington. I, was, I couldn't believe it. The, our, our military is so defined by the offense. You know, our, our military strategy is we don't want the country ever to be attacked. So we are going to design a military is designed to fight over there. You know, our military is designed to fight in other people's countries first. So much so that we had no air base next to our nation's capital with armed fighter jets at the time of 9-11. Uh, this is something Congress and the presidents have agreed on for decades and decades by funding the military. Instead, they built, what did they build? Aircraft carriers, 13 of them at a billion dollars a piece. Aircraft carriers are very bad for defense. What do they do? They're like parking an airport off some other, somebody's country and using it to bomb them repeatedly. Right? Think about that. So that, you know, the M1 Abrams tank, our main battle tank is designed to drive fast into enemy territory and shoot and destroy their tanks. It is not built to conduct defensive operations in the homeland of the United States. So my just, just my point is when I'm in Washington DC at 9-11 arguing, thinking about these issues and I'm learning that our military has no real defensive capabilities for protecting the continental United States has Congress not actually encouraged the president if it gives him or her tools that are only designed for offense. To say, contra to Barbara Lee, we're going to actually let you have a more free hand as long as you fight abroad. We're not going to try to stop you. So I think that's the hard, even harder question for Paul's. What do you do when Congress is silent? Do we take the money they've spent, the weapons they've paid for, as a kind of implicit consent to? using force abroad offensively. That's probably the most aggressive Hamiltonian position I think you could take on this. Okay, we have about 20 minutes. We have Abraham here with a question. We have a few other questions. And then before we go too much longer, uh, Professor Yu, uh, we should go back and uh, talk about some of the cases that we've talked about in class, especially Korematsu. So mm. go ahead, Abraham. Hi, Professor Yu. Uh, thank you for coming to talk to us. I'm Abraham Figueroa. I'm a first year um, political science major. With the oh, Abraham, don't study. thank me. I'm just sitting at home talking to a little screen. <laughs> it would be much better if I was there. Then you can thank me. In well, you've still got four, five, six more years to graduate these days. So I'll, maybe you'll thank me in person when I get to come in the future. <laughs> Um, my question was, um, so on the war on terror, it has evolved over the years, and now we fight a lot more uh, wars by proxy. So mm. my question was on the separation of powers and the executive power specifically. So Congress now has the ability to either uh, fund directly through military aid uh, certain regimes or provide military training or provide them with arms. So how does the executive have a voice in that situation, or should they have more of a voice whenever it comes to um, like military aid? It's a, it's a great question, Abraham. I think so. It's I think it's an implication of this Helvidius Pacificus view. If you think Pacificus or the Hamiltonian view is right, the president exercises all executive power uh, that's not taken away by the Constitution and given to Congress. So some of the you know uh, some of it is shared, like the treaty power is considered an executive power, but in our Constitution, the Senate participates. Appointments to the Supreme Court are as well. The biggest power is the one you're mentioning, Abraham, that's not discussed in the Constitution, which is foreign policy. 
Who gets to decide whether we're going to be friendly to a country or hostile? Who gets to decide whether Israel exists? Who gets to decide that Jerusalem will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel rather than Tel Aviv? The Constitution actually doesn't say. That's actually what the Helvidius, remember, that's what the Helvidius Pacificus debate is about. That's the debate we're having now about whether there's a war. Uh, for Helvidius Pacificus, it was the neutrality proclamation. Madison's arguments that Solomon started with are all against the idea that President Washington could declare neutrality in the French Revolution. And Hamilton is saying, no, the president gets to decide the foreign policy of the United States. Both of them are arguing and acknowledge that the Constitution does not say the word foreign policy anywhere and gives it to anybody. So I would say, actually, Abraham, that it is uh, the it is decided the same way I would say the war is war powers are decided. The president has the executive power. Everything that executives have done in the past, leading up to the framing of the Constitution, that are explained by Machiavelli, by Law, Hobbes, Locke, Blackstone, and our own founders. Hamilton, I think, is the greatest theorist of executive power. But right in debate with Madison. They would all say the president sets foreign policy. That's the ex an executive function and given to the president through the executive power clause. But then Madison in part is right too. Congress doesn't have to agree. Congress can set its own foreign policy through the exact tools Abraham mentioned, foreign aid, military aid. And this, this ability, and this goes back to my physics friend, leads to conflict, not a harmonious circling of the spheres through the laws of gravity, but more of a Hamiltonian conflict between the branches. And so the president can say, I support Israel. I think Jerusalem is the capital. Congress can say, well, then figure out how to build a new embassy building in Jerusalem because we're not paying for it. And I would say both are constitutional. So we're, uh, you, you, we have war over war in a way. We have constitutional war over foreign policy. So Abraham, I think you're right. I think Congress is the one that decides where money gets spent and who receives it. Uh, usually they give the president the right to stop the spending if he or she thinks it's necessary for national security reasons. But Congress doesn't have to do that. Congress can give money to any nation at once, whether the president agrees with it or not. Usually they try to work out an accommodation, just like war. Too. I th so my argument has been throughout these uh, questions is that basic dynamic just repeats itself on questions of war, foreign policy, the separation of powers. I think the Madisonian view is more Congress is dominant. They set the policy. Madison would probably say it's up to Congress to decide whether to recognize Israel. It's up to Congress to decide where Jerusalem is, whether Jerusalem is a capital or not. Once Congress decides through foreign aid, through statutes, then the president just carries it out. Oh, let me say, uh, uh, Phil did ask me to mention some of the cases. Let me just describe the detainee cases. So then that's what I would think about the detainee cases. Uh, once you go down the path of war, uh, the, the first most immediate questions are, can you shoot and kill the enemy rather than arresting them and sending them back for trial? Right? If you're in this criminal justice world, as we were until the, the police don't have the right to just start shooting everybody they think might be a suspect. If someone's a suspect, you have to arrest them. You can only use force to defend the lives of others or yourself as an officer. If someone runs away, you let them run away as long as they don't pose a threat to anyone. The military rule is different. Anyone you reasonably think is a member of the enemy, you can use force to shoot them unless they are surrendering or they are Enable to unable to fight. So uh, we ra I face that question in uh, the very first use of the very first drone was used in the deserts of Yemen. It was a crazy rocket scientist kind of guy. He was actually a test pilot. He took a surveillance drone and he strapped a missile onto it. And he sold it to the CIA and they found an Al Qaeda leader who at the time, who by the way, was an American citizen but he was one of the top Al Qaeda cabinet members, as it were, driving in a car in Yemen. And so we had to face this question, do we, can we use a missile to kill him? Or do we have to send someone out to try to arrest him? And so I thought it's war. Once you make the decision it's war, you can use force 
to kill members of the enemy if you have to. You don't, you're not limited just to arresting them. Same question comes up with detention. If it's peace, you have to right, arrest them, give them a lawyer, give them Miranda warnings, bring them to trial. If it's war, what do you do? Well, in war, we have prisoner war camps. We don't try them. They're not guilty of a crime. You just hold them so they can't fight against you back on the battlefield again. And we've done that repeatedly in our history. Every war, you do that. In fact, you would prefer to capture members of the enemy and hold them. And so uh, these detainee cases that you've read, Hamdi, Boumedien, and so on, starting with Kieran, these are really questions of, in my mind, in my view, you know, I worked on the cases themselves too, is, uh, is that military model inappropriate? Um, what if some of those people aren't captured in Afghanistan? What if we capture some of them within the United States? And so here I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, one last, I hate to tell personal s- stories, but well, I know as you get to, I like telling personal stories, but I'd rather talk about the constitutional law. But uh, to, to illustrate, um, I tried to find examples of this from our past. This is what lawyers do. We try to analogize what we're facing today with something we did before. So we're looking at when did we ever fight a war where actually Americans were on the other side? Kieran is an example, but it's such a weird example. There aren't that many Americans who fought for the Germans or the Japanese. There are some that all, several of the cases go to the Supreme Court, actually. Uh, but you'll notice in Kieran, the court says being an American doesn't mean you're not subject to the laws of war. Just because an American joins up with the Germans doesn't mean they somehow have this kind of force field around them, which means they're just still to be treated as criminals and not subject to the right to use force, the right to capture them. But the real example in my mind uh, was the Civil War. And if there was a person, I think, who we look back repeatedely for, for um, guidance about how to deal with these 9-11 questions, it was Abraham Lincoln. He faced this question very early on. And remember, Lincoln's theory of the Civil War was that every member of the Confederacy was still an American. And so he had to face the same questions we did. What happens if there are Americans fighting against you? Can you shoot back? Lincoln obviously said yes. Can you capture them and detain them as prisoners of war, even though they're Americans? Or do they get a jury trial right? Chief Justice Taney, he thought they got a jury trial right. You may remember there's a case that's mentioned in Kieran called Merriman, where uh, President Lincoln's uh, troops arrested a person, a Marylander, who was trying to drill troops for the Confederacy at the very outbreak of the Civil War. He's captured by the Union. He's held in a a fort. It's the the fort that's Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor, the one about which the Star Spangled Banner is written. And this guy gets a lawyer, this Confederate sympathizer. Chief Justice Taney happens to be in Baltimore then. And he files for a writ with the Chief Justice. And he says, please release me. I'm an American citizen. I have a right to a jury trial. And, and Chief Justice Tony actually issued a writ of habeas corpus. This goes to this, you know, the earlier questions about what do you do when the branches conflict? Tony actually ordered his release. He's the Chief Justice of the United States. says he's rebooting rebooting his computer so
So we don't have much time left. We should, uh, Mary Francis, you're gonna ask about Korematsu? Okay, so let's get that question in about Korematsu. Uh, what other questions, we're just gonna have a few minutes, what other questions you wanna get at? And we can, go ahead, just tell me and then we can order them, yeah. Okay, Justice Scalia's dissent in Hamdi. Okay. Non-state actors in what? Yeah, I know, I know, we need, we, we need more time. With, with what? With Okay, okay. With Gitmo, yep. Yeah. If executive powers could be interpreted more broadly. Okay, well, he would be the person that, I don't know that anyone can interpret them more broadly than he does, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's go, he's, he's, he says he's about to come back. Let's, Mary Francis, you're gonna ask about uh, Korematsu, right? So let's ask about Korematsu and let's get the question in about Hamdi and Scalia's descent, because um, that, that should be relatively quickly. I don't know that we'll get much more than that in, um, but then we'll just go around and try to get some other ones, okay? All right. Mary Francis, you have a microphone. Yes, Where's the other microphone? I lost it. Okay. You wanted to ask the enhanced interrogation question? What is that? Okay, and then we'll come over here. Sorry about this. We can probably go about five minutes over. Uh, I know uh, some of you have other classes, so if you have to go, just, just go. But for those who can stay or want to stay, we'll go a few minutes over. I'll try to get some of these questions in, okay.
Okay, so the, it's the very last one. Um, Professor, you mentioned it. The, um, um, the uh, Budamine versus Bush 2008. I mean, it's interesting. It's just a very long and complicated case. And I would just, um, basically, I don't want you to kill yourself trying to understand that case. Um, uh, it's worth trying to do so, but it's just very complicated. And the excerpt is very long. So you, you won't be responsible for that case on, on the exam. Let me just put it that way. Yeah. I'll tell you too, what I'm, I think what we're gonna do for the exam is I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you multiple essay questions and we're not gonna do the IDs, but we'll talk about it more. But on, back. Okay, I think we got you back. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Well, it's all right. We're, we'll go. Uh, we'll go a few minutes longer. Um, we got a couple of questions teed up for you, so we'll go about ten more minutes, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, sure. We'll just make the best of it. Go ahead, Mary Francis. Hi, I'm Mary Francis Myler. I'm a junior in the program of liberal studies, and I have a question. Um, kind of starting with the Korematsu case, hmm. we talked in class about how the justification for the decision in that case stemmed largely from like the Congress authorized the military to do what they saw necessary in this conflict and the military deemed it necessary to place um, citizens of Japanese ancestry in internment camps. And kind of the argument and the discussion we had in class was because the military was acting on like kind of classified information, there was no way for the court to really rule whether or not that, de or that decision was well made. And so they had to accept that it was constitutional since the military had been authorized by Congress with that power. Um, and then in the kind of tying it to this conflict um, stemming out of 9-11, Scalia's dissent in the Boumediene case talks about kind of the disastrous consequences um, in these cases where the courts requested this sensitive military information that ended up being leaked back um, to Al-Qaeda in these actors against the United States um, with disastrous consequences. And so I was just wondering, how do we kind of understand the use of information in these particularly like sensitive military cases, um, this kind of delicate balance of pursuing justice while also maintaining national security. Do you have any thoughts on how information plays into these judicial rulings? No, it's, a, it's a great question. And actually uh, the, this point of tension that you identify really was at the heart of why we were worried about bringing all the captured terrorists to trial. I mean, obviously, we could have done that, although there were about, you know, there were thousands that we captured. We certainly could have had a trial in federal court for the major leaders, all of whom we pretty much captured, except for Osama bin Laden and the number two guy, Dr. Zawahiri. But we captured pretty much the or killed the top leadership of Al Qaeda other than them. And so why didn't we have a trial? Um, people still ask this to this day. Uh, why did we try to create a military court system, these military commissions that were uh, used in Kieran right, and were used in the Civil War instead? And uh, Mary Francis, you really put your finger on it. The problem was that we were worried from past example that if we used a civilian trial, all kinds of information come out, comes out. And it's under our Bill of Rights. We want the defendant to have the right to force the government to tell everything it knows about the case, about the defendant, to make sure that that defendant really is getting a fair trial and that we're not making any mistakes. There, we've made the judgment as a society. There's no uh, countervailing cost worth balancing against that, right? The problem with doing it in wartime is that if you were to try every prisoner of war in court rather than holding them in a prisoner of war camp, 
then that prisoner has the right under the Bill of Rights to force the government to tell everything it knows about them. And as you say, and as Justice Scalia said, that would require the disclosure of enormous amounts of information. So I'll, I'll tell you the first fellow, this fellow Hamdi, who comes in, he says, uh, I want to be tried. How do you know I'm really a member of Al-Qaeda? Well, I'm going to make you produce every member of Al-Qaeda, all the leaders that you have, and I want to ask them in open in court, do they recognize me? Do they know I'm a member? Because these guys weren't wearing uniforms. You know, they aren't fighting on behalf of regular armed forces. They're disguised as civilians. He could just say, I really am a civilian. How do you know? I want you to tell us. It's not just that, but in fact, it had unfortunately happened before. So as I said, before 9-11, remember, we were using the criminal justice system to handle terrorism. And uh, Al-Qaeda operatives had tried to destroy the World Trade Center before in 1993, if you remember, and came close to it. Uh, they did explode a bomb in the garage underneath the World Trade Center, but structurally they hit the wrong place and didn't fall, the whole tower didn't collapse. But it well could have if it had been in a different place. We did capture and put on trial the people who participate in that attack. In the process, that defendant said, I want to see a list of all the people you think I was conspiring with to blow up the Trade Center. He effectively asked for a list of everyone we thought was a member of Al-Qaeda back in 1998. And we turned over the list uh, as the government because that's what we had to do under the Bill of Rights. Uh, and we found a copy of that list in an Al-Qaeda safe house in Afghanistan after 9-11 when we invaded. So imagine what an intelligence coup it was for them to have a list of everyone we thought was fighting on their side. They could close down operations we had infiltrated and they could find new people to carry them out instead. So that, that, that fight over information, you're right, my friend, is critical. And in the criminal justice system, we do not have any barriers to it. But in wartime, intelligence is perhaps one of our best advantages. And so we wanted to figure out a system. And we thought using military trials was the best way to have a trial give some fairness to a defendant, but also protect the security of that information so that it doesn't fall in the wrong hands. I would say Karmatsu is a little different. That kind of information, I would say, is the government uh, made a decision about what was necessary for military conduct. I personally, I happen to think the government made the wrong decision. Uh, and the wrong decision was they used race, Japanese uh, uh, extraction, as a proxy for sympathy with the Japanese empire, our enemy in wartime. Uh, that, I think that just uses race as a classification um, and turned out to be wrong. Um, however, I, don't, I do think the court in Korematsu was correct to say we should not exercise intrusive judicial review over the way the executive makes a decision. Take that forward now to today with, Bum you mentioned Boumedian, you know, Hamdi. I think that these were a mistake by the court in the sense that they said, no, we do feel confident. We are going to review these kinds of decisions now made by the military. But then they have upheld every single one of the detentions. Uh, they've actually said, well, we agree with what the government has done. So it's interesting, just as a matter of high constitutional politics, if you think the government has been wrong after 9-11, and its detention policies. Are you happier that the court has blessed them all? Or, and this is Justice Jackson's interesting um, dissent in Korematsu. If the government is going to do something unconstitutional and use race as a proxy for loyalty to the country, uh, do you want the Supreme Court to actually bless it? Or would you rather Supreme Court say, these are military decisions, they're gonna be right or wrong, let the, pol the political system decide and hold the government accountable if it makes a mistake, but it's not, we're courts, we're not gonna bless that. We're not gonna participate in that. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what the Korematsu court did in the end. Professor, you can, in 60 seconds, uh, Justice Scalia's dissent in Hamdi, what do you think of that? So I, you know, I, I, see, I see this sort of formalist attraction of the idea saying we can't be at war without a declaration of war. I think what he, even though Scalia is a great originalist, it's only, a, Sometimes, strangely, at this opinion, he didn't look at the history. 
And the history, which I've exhaustively researched, you're welcome to look at, is no one has ever thought declarations of war are necessary to be in a state of war. It goes back to the original points that were made. What if you're attacked? You don't declare war when you're attacked. You just respond immediately. In fact, we've only had five declarations of war, and the United States has been in military conflicts more than 100 times. And even Great Britain at the time of the Constitution had fought many, many wars and had few declarations. Often the declarations come years after the war starts. So I could see Scalia's attraction to the idea, oh, there's this bright line rule or this switch you turn on. Declaration of war is on, then all these things happen in society. Rules change, powers of the government expand, power of the executive expands. But I think he was mistaken in thinking the declaration of war was the necessary key to turn to enter this state of war. What about the suspension of the writ? He says you either have to do it or suspend the writ or a, a criminal trial. Yeah, so this interesting thing is whether the writ of habeas corpus, which I don't think he really examined carefully, applies during wartime. So, uh, you know, talks of, there, there are exceptions to the writ that are talked about in the clause itself. But it seems to me not practical for the writ of habeas corpus to apply in wartime because then every single prisoner of war could file for a writ of habeas corpus, right? They're all being held by the government. Why don't they get a right to go to federal court? Why didn't every one of the millions of prisoners of war in World War II have a right for a writ of habeas corpus or the hundreds of thousands of Confederacy prisoners in the Civil War have a right to it? This is actually what Lincoln, so Lincoln's response actually is very interesting. Chief Justice Taney at the outset of the Civil War says, release that guy. He's an American. Even though you think he's fighting for the Confederacy, he, I'm issuing him a writ. Lincoln refused to obey it. And he, his position was the writ does not apply in wartime to enemy prisoners, because if it did, how could you fight a war? We'd spend all our time deciding rid of habeas corpus cases and not fighting anybody. And so I think Lincoln was right about that. Um, and that's the view we took. Uh, and it's interesting, the court in Boumedia, and you'll notice, slips by it. They have not extended the writ to Afghanistan and Iraq. They play games and say, well, the writ applies in American territory if you're in wartime. They ignore the Civil War. And then they say, eh, Cuba is part of America for purposes of the writ. So I, I found actually, you know, they could have said the writ applies abroad in wartime. That would have made sense to me. Or they could have said the writ does not apply in wartime, even on our territory. That would have made sense. But to say it kind of applies because Cuba is part of the United States, that made very little sense to me at the time. And what's contrary to Supreme Court precedent at that time as it existed. We are, we are beyond time and about to lose the room. So um, thank you very much, Professor Yu. And, uh, Thanks, everybody. John, we're going to sign off right now, but thanks again. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties at the end.